this is uh, something that I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background about how we came about this idea of, of freshwater heritage. When I was still working at Smithfield, uh, Mike contacted me about some students that he had uh, that were interested in working on a project about Struble's Creek. And they were interested in exploring or including some information about the history of Struble's Creek uh, in the presentation that they were putting together. And he asked just if I would be willing to sit down and talk with them uh, as the director of Smithfield. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to do that. So I did sit down and talk with them then. And the idea, of course, made a lot of sense to me because you know we at Smithfield were interpreting the history of the mill ruin that's there on that property. And so that was related to the creek directly. The mill was actually fed by Struble's Creek. And we also interpreted the spring house that was out in front of Smithfield Plantation. That's where they got their drinking water. So, you know, water and why this, the Preston house was where it was made some sense. So, you know, that started to kind of generate. And this became a tremendous learning curve that Mike and I have kind of interacted ever since then. This has been about seven years ago that this was done. Uh, and we have been talking about this idea ever since. And Mike and Seeds, who you're going to hear more about later tonight, kind of coined this phrase of freshwater heritage and the idea that uh, history is tied to our water as a resource. And so that's what we're going to explore tonight. And what we're going to do is take a look at three streams that feed Struble's Creek. They're all spring fed. Uh, there are literally hundreds of springs here in Blacksburg. And you don't realize it because it's not a resource to us anymore. Uh, the creeks that they feed or the streams that they feed are covered over for the most part. And so we're going to explore those a little bit and you're going to realize that you're passing by them, passing over them every day and not realizing that they're there. So I'm going to begin with the history part and talk a little bit about those streams itself, how we used them during the history of Blacksburg itself. And then Mike's going to pick up and, and talk about how we're recovering from what we did to those streams historically. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's kind of the idea here. William Black talked about the springs that were here in this area when he wrote the petition to the uh, state legislature to form the town of Blacksburg, which he named after himself. Uh, William Black was uh, one of the two landowners named Black who uh, used this land and formed it themselves uh, as a, a small town. But you can see here he refers to the excellent springs thereon agreeably and well situated for a small town. So we're going to figure out a little bit about what that agreeable part is here. So who came before us to the Blacksburg area? Who was here first, let's say? So we think, we tend to think European, but we weren't the first ones that were here. In actuality, the Native Americans had been here for quite a while uh, in this area. Now, we typically say that they probably didn't live here, although there is some archeological evidence that they at least had some temporary living quarters here. Uh, and specifically, one of those archaeological sites is what we refer to as the Shannon site. That site was dug archaeologically when the um, Blacksburg Country Club was being built. And it is located where the Country Club is now. And what they found there was that there had actually been two occupations of that site by two different tribes of Native Americans. One of which was probably farming, so they were actually living there and one was actually a burial ground. And the other didn't realize that each were there uh, because they wouldn't have used it as a, a resident site if they had known it was a burial ground, it would have been sacred. So uh, some pretty interesting archeological history of the Native Americans being here. Why were the Native Americans here? What were they doing here? We talk about talk about farming and hunting grounds. Now what was leading them here animal-wise then that they were hunting and what were the animals doing here? Buffalo. Yeah, buffalo and they were following the water, right? Buffalo need water just like we as humans need water. 
And you think about the topography, and I actually brought in a topographical map here, and, and I won't hold it up because it'll be impossible for you to see here, but you think about the topography of this area, and you realize that if you're going to be traveling through this area, you can't go directly west, which is what the Europeans wanted to do, right? Push westward. You can't do that here. Why is that? Well, think about the mountain ranges, and the mountain ranges are going from north to west, basically, northwest, and they're in your way. And so if you're trying to go directly west, you're gonna be doing up and down, up and down over that. So rather, what would you do? You follow where the water goes, and the water goes through the lowest point, through the valleys. Well, think about the valley drives that we have through here. Specifically, think about, let's say, going through Ellet Valley, uh, coming from Finn Castle, let's say, Botetourt County, uh, through to Blacksburg. That's a relevant point because Smithfield Plantation, built by William Preston, is connected to Greenfield Plantation, built by William Preston, the same guy, uh, in Botetourt County. And that valley is literally a road, a straight road through the valley between those two homes. It was their way of traveling. So the Europeans followed the Native Americans who had followed the animals. So the water is one of the guiding forces here, so keep that in mind. This is a photograph of the archaeological dig of the Shannon site. I just threw this up here so that you can see it, and you'll see those small round holes, and you can see that they are a line. That basically was a fence line. Uh, that was during the residential occupation of this site. And then you'll see the larger indentations there, uh, the darker uh, sites towards the middle of the picture there. Those are actually grave sites. Uh, so again, two different occupations. They wouldn't have buried uh, their own inside uh, their compound. Uh, so a, a really interesting uh, archaeological dig. And there's information about this in the library at Virginia Tech uh, that you can get if you're interested in pursuing that further. So the Native Americans have been here. Who came next then? The Europeans and this idea of European migration westward. Uh, so we have then the Draper's Meadow Settlement that you've heard about here. This started in the 1730s, 1740s, around that time period, uh, and went on into the 1750s uh, when there was a major problem with that settlement. We'll talk about that in just a moment. You have Smithfield Plantation in the 1770s, and then the town of Blacksburg being formed in the 1790s. Uh, and, and one of my colleagues, Hugh Campbell, I think describes this really well. He talks about this as kind of waves of people. So we're using the water analogy again here and thinking about the people coming through this area were coming in kind of waves as political and um, uh, sociological economic situation allowed them to do that. So why here? Why is that important? We talked a little bit about this. It really is the real estate mantra, location, location, location. If you think about getting into Blacksburg, Christiansburg area, coming through Ellet Valley, for instance, or even use Interstate 81 now because it's generally a similar path, and you think about what happens as you're driving through, let's say you're coming from uh, Roanoke, Salem area, and you get to about 10 miles outside of Christiansburg, and what happens? You start going up, right? And so think about doing that on horseback as you're traveling, and you make that pretty steep ascent uh, over a pretty uh, long amount of time. And then as you get to Blacksburg, and, and I encourage you to check this out on the topographical map over here, you hit a plateau. It levels out again. And there's a spot then that you're going to want to rest your horses. And what are your horses going to need after they've climbed that? You're going to need some fresh water, right? And so here in Blacksburg, there's water just bubbling out of the ground, and you've ridden your horses up this steep hill. What are you going to do? You're going to stop, right? So it became this kind of natural stopping point on this path that was uh, this great westward migration route. So that's where, why we're here. We think of water as uh, a resource, typically. Drinking water we need, right? And that's what we were just talking about with the horses and the humans needing water. But think about agricultural water. If you're going to be uh, creating farms here, growing things here, you're going to need some water to support that. 
even industrial water. Here in Blacksburg, we know that in the, the early uh, period of formation for this town, there were several tanners here. What do tanners need when they're tanning leather? Lots of water, right? So the tanner's house, we're gonna talk about that, is right here on one of the springs that's, that fed the town. And even operating mills, for instance. As I said, we interpreted a mill at Smithfield Plantation. They used water power to drive this mill so they could grind the grains that they were growing in order to turn them into whiskey. That was one of their major products. We don't typically think anymore of water as a barrier, but in colonial times, water here was a barrier. It was an obstacle to them traveling. Now we typically think of in the, the eastern part of the state, uh, really Richmond and eastward, water was a resource to them for shipping things. On the James River, you can put stuff on a bateau boat and send it down the James and you can get to the Atlantic Ocean and no barriers. But you can't do that here. And so the new river is not a navigable river. It's not something you could use to ship goods away. So it was a barrier to their travel. So what did we create instead? Ferries, right? You had to get across that river now because it's a barrier. So think of the road names that now have ferry in them. Pepper's Ferry, Ingalls Ferry, Snyder's Ferry, all of those were ferries to get you across the new river. So shipping was a real problem for them and water was not a solution for them to do that. A little bit east of here, they were trying to do that with the James River. Remember they were digging a, a canal that, that they were going to ultimately use for shipping that never got completed, but uh, it was a grand idea. Now there's also water here in Blacksburg that is as a defining boundary. Now this, I'm gonna take you back to your uh, fourth grade history classes where you studied about uh, the French and Indian War and the resolution of the French and Indian War involved the Eastern Continental Divide. So does anybody remember what the Eastern Continental Divide is? It's where water flows in one direction towards, in our case, the Atlantic Ocean, or in the other direction towards the Mississippi River, ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. Well, guess what? The Eastern Continental Divide goes smack dab through the middle of Blacksburg. If you go up to the Blacksburg Municipal Golf Course and stand in their parking lot and spit, half of it's gonna to go to the Atlantic Ocean and half of it's gonna to go to the Gulf of Mexico. That's on the Eastern Continental Divide. If you haven't ever been up there, I encourage you to go do that because there's a little gazebo off of their parking lot. Stand in that gazebo and look out on the view that's there. And you'll be looking down that valley that was that road of migration. That was the way people got into Blacksburg. And it's a beautiful sight to see. But it is a political boundary, let's say. Remember the resolution of the French and Indian War, and you know the French and Indian War was stirring up the Native Americans as well. They were uh, dissatisfied with this idea of land ownership that the Europeans were bringing into the area, and there were quite a few conflicts about that. And the resolution of that in the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was that Europeans would not settle west of the Eastern Continental Divide. So that blocked off half of Blacksburg, basically. Now that ultimately didn't stand for very long, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well, but that put us on the edge of a very strict frontier. And this area was hotly contested. So uh, the things that were happening prior to this proclamation, for instance, the Draper's Meadow uh, massacre, we call it a massacre, uh, was all related in the turmoil that was building up to the French and Indian War. So let's talk about the Draper's Meadow settlement then a little bit. This is in 1755, what we define as a massacre. From the European point of view, it was a massacre. Uh, it was, as I said, one of the many clashes that were indicative of all of this underlying tension that was going on. And you think about that, in the idea of land ownership. 
you know, to the Native Americans, remember we had talked about them being here before, land ownership was a foreign idea. Everybody owned the land. Everybody used it. It was not something that you would claim and say this is mine and that's mine and that's mine and I'm going to sell the rest of that. Uh, that was the, the origin of the clash there. Um, you know that the Shawnee Indians attacked that settlement in 1755. You know that James Patton, who was one of the major Scots-Irish uh, folks that were in here selling off this land, developing the land, was killed in that attack. Uh, there's some idea that possibly he was even targeted in that attack. Maybe they knew he was there and they came to get him. Uh, that's a possibility. We'll never really know that for sure. But you can imagine what that did to that settlement then in 1755. Multiple people killed. You know the story of Mary Draper Ingalls who was captured from that uh, and taken out into the Ohio River Valley and managed to escape and came back. But that made that settlement then way too far beyond the edge of the frontier and it made basically the Scots-Irish left the area. They just uh, abandoned that settlement. It's interesting to me that the prices, the Germans, didn't leave. Uh, and I, I've thought about that and wondered why that was. And this is my own supposition speaking here, but I wonder if the Native Americans didn't have quite as much a problem with the Germans because the Germans' idea was, this is my farm, I'm going to farm this, I'm going to support my family on it, not really interested in getting huge tracts of land and developing that further. They were doing it for their family. That fits a little bit better with the Native American idea of what land usage ought to be. So I don't know that for sure, but it, it makes me wonder about that. This is a, a monument about the Draper's Meadow Massacre that still exists. It's not in the same place that it is in that photograph. Anybody know where that is now? But yeah, between, between the upper and lower duck ponds, the little land bridge that's there, yeah. It's almost mostly buried. You can barely read it now because of the, the way that it's situated. But. So Smithfield Plantation then comes along after that. The ban on settling west of the Continental Divide is lifted in 1768, so about five years after the proclamation uh, that had put that in place. But notice that Smithfield is located just west of the Eastern Continental Divide. So it broke the, the ideas of what that treaty was about. And that wasn't a coincidence, I think. When William Preston was very intentionally pushing that line uh, in developing his house. The tensions were still high. You know, think about prior to the Revolution that the, there were still conflicts between Native Americans and Europeans on that boundary. Uh, and then I also want you to think about Smithfield and where it's located. And I mentioned that it is right on Struble's Creek. So they used the, uh, the creek itself for a mill, but they also got their own drinking water from a natural spring that is right in front of Smithfield Plantation. It's still there. Uh, if you're ever out on 460 or out in front of Smithfield, if you stand in front of Smithfield and look just a little bit to your right, you'll see a very large sycamore tree. What do sycamore trees do, Jeff? <laughs> Grow next to, to water, right? So right there on their spring is uh, a, a large sycamore tree that's still there. The spring still is an active spring. Now, let's look at Blacksburg's establishment in 1798. And you can see on the left-hand side there is a map of the original 16 squares of Blacksburg. And if you pay particular attention, you'll notice that in get my mouse here, that in this corner here, that's a little stream. And if you notice over here, that's a little stream. So it's kind of interesting to me that he placed that 16 squares, 37 acres of land, right in between two natural springs and the streams that those springs are feeding. It basically makes it so that nobody has to go any further than two blocks to get their water. That's a pretty convenient thing, marketing, location, 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 right? 
And we use the names here of John and William Black. John and William were brothers that inherited land. Their dad, Samuel, had actually bought the land, but never moved here uh, because of the Draper's Meadow attack. So he never came to the area himself. But his sons inherited it, and, and both of them came to the area. Interestingly enough, William is the one that formed the town of Blacksburg, and he ultimately ended up leaving. Uh, Blacksburg didn't take off fast enough for him. Uh, John is the one that stayed, and so all of the descendants that are in the area still descend from John himself. William went on out to Ohio uh, and did some more developing out there. So let's take a little trip here through these springs here. We're going to start with the first tributary. This would be the easternmost, and we call that Spout Spring. Uh, and on the map here, you can see this number one there is the Spout Spring site. And I know it's really difficult to see, but this is the intersection of Clay Street and Horton Street in the original 16 squares of Blacksburg. So this would be Clay Street and this would be Horton Street. And it's that intersection right here. And you'll see in the photographs here, let's go ahead and go through that. This is the foundation uh, of the spring house that was there. The foundation is still there. The spring is still active. This picture was just taken a few months ago. Uh, and so water continues to bubble up through that. And it does, even in the driest of conditions, it is an active uh, spring there. And you can see that in that foundation, there were some pipes that people had put in to get water out. This is the site. And this will be able to, to give you a little bit more orientation as to where we're talking about. So this is Clay Street. This is First Baptist Church on Clay Street there, and then Wharton Street goes off right through there. And the spring is just to the right of where I'm standing to take this photograph now. Now, that spring, let me go back here, if I can do that. That spring is what we call daylighted. In other words, it's open to the air. Uh, from for about I don't know maybe 30 feet or so from where it originates here until it gets to the where the grass is here and then it's actually put into a pipe and it goes in a pipe underneath this lot here and goes under Horton Street and then it comes out of the ground again out of that pipe and it is daylighted between the back of First Baptist Church and the next street which is Penn Street right and then at Penn Street, it goes underground again. It actually goes under a set of apartments there. Uh, and then it comes out a little bit for um, a little corner lot there. There's just a brick ranch that's built on that, and they actually have it daylighted. And there's some beautiful willow trees in the spot where they've got it daylighted. Then it goes underground again. It goes under Church Street. And then it comes back to this next photo that I was showing you. This is the Main Street Inn is on the left-hand side of this picture. Uh, this is Kent Square across the street here. Uh, and the Alexander Black House used to sit right here on Main Street. So this stream actually went through the Alexander Black property as well. Main Street Inn actually daylighted the stream. Now they did that, again, for only about 30 feet or so. But this was something that the town, at the time that was being developed, was making a conscious effort in asking developers to daylight the stream wherever possible. Uh, and it was a little bit of a challenge for them to do that, but the architects came up with a, what I think is a really nice solution. They moved parking under the building uh, and made enough space for themselves to be able to daylight this. And it makes a lovely spot on that lot now. So if you're ever walking by that on Main Street, you drive by there lots of times, I'm sure. Stop sometime and take a look at that. It's really a pretty nice little spot. But then it goes back into a pipe right here goes under Kent Square, goes all the way down to Draper Road, and it follows Draper Road underground. And you don't see it again until the duck pond. It doesn't pop up again until the duck pond. Now, that's a recurring theme, so let's keep going here. Now, I'm going to add a, a second spring-fed tributary to that first branch. comes out of the Preston Draper neighborhood. There's an active spring there. Again, it's piped all through that neighborhood, so you don't really see it, until it pops up on the Five Chimneys lot, which is directly across Draper Road from us in this building here. 
and there's a little daylighted section of it there. And then it goes under this little bridge. This is where it originates. So uh, it comes out of that pipe and goes through the Five Chimneys site, goes into this pipe here. This is the corner of Washington and Draper. And then it joins that same spring that we were just looking at right there at kind of that low point, low point in the road that you can see right here. If you stand at the storm drains there on that road and listen, you'll hear it. It's there, always running underground. <coughs> and then from there is when it, it's piped through here, through the campus, doesn't show up again until the duck pond. So let's look at the second tributary. This we call the central branch. This would be originating here near Owen Street, and we're going to look at that. It originates back here in the woods just behind this, and this is the Owen Street Park, and this is in that first curve of Owen Street there. And you can see this stream, and you can see it's a, a stream bed there. It's, a, it's daylighted, uh, got a lot of natural vegetation in it. It does run all of the time, but there are no trees over it to speak of. You can see that someone in this has planted some trees there. Trees are important to help with shade to keep the sun from just baking the, the stream when it's open to the daylight. So uh, you need to be able to encourage the aerobic processes that are going to go on to purify the water. So this is not an ideal habitat for it, but it is at least open to the, to the air. That goes through that neighborhood there and shows up again right here next to the Blacksburg Rescue Squad. This is standing on Progress Street here. And you can see that again, a daylighted area. It's actually got some uh, rip rock there to hold the, keep that from eroding there. And it goes back underground. You, anybody know where it goes from there? Is that the one goes under there? Yeah. Now, I'm standing, I just turned around from the previous picture and took this picture. This sidewalk is actually acknowledging the fact that there's a stream underneath it. That's why it's not just a straight sidewalk. It's actually kind of curved. It follows the natural curve of the stream that would have gone through that parking lot. So you know, this goes through that parking lot to get then ultimately to College Avenue where it goes under Moe's and the Lyric and the Mill all of those buildings, it literally runs in the basement of those buildings. It's not daylighted there because it's under a building. But. And then it doesn't show up again until here. It does the very same thing as it was indicated on that map. It goes into a pipe. Now, piping it like that has created lots of problems, both with overflow. Uh, when it rains really hard, those pipes are not quite large enough. Uh, and so we have flooded Donaldson Brown before, we've you know, had some problems with that. Uh, it also affects the stream quality, and Mike is going to talk a little bit about that as more uh, as we go on. And then the third tributary is what we call the Webb Branch, and its origin is a little bit less uh, easy to determine here. It kind of starts to show up as evidence in just some pipes that are there. Uh, those pipes are kind of handling stormwater runoff and the natural uh, spring. But this is uh, standing on Patrick Henry Drive and looking. Uh, Progress Street is going off to the, on the right there, going back towards Main Street. So that little triangle between Patrick Henry and Progress and Main Street there. And it originates in there. And you can see there are a lot of apartments and a lot of paved asphalt there that is collecting stormwater and dropping it. So we need to deal with that as well. And I'm going to turn around in the next photograph. And this is looking down then. Progress Street is now on our left. And this goes down and it goes down behind Lindsay and David West's property there. Uh, their house is just down in here. Giles Road. Oh, Giles Road sorry. I was saying Progress, wasn't I? Sorry about that. And so if you're going down Giles Road, you're looking at Again, several evidences. This is a set of new apartments that they built there. And boy, look at that pipe that they put in to be able to handle the water. And that stream is normally not running that hard, but there are times that it needs it. So we've gotten wise enough to oversize the, the pipes that we're putting in. Here it shows up again. This is actually Hevner's, uh, Hevner's Hardware, the, their storage building behind there. Uh, and this is, help me out with the name of this road, Mike. Cambridge. Cambridge, yes, thank you. 
Uh, and we're getting ready to go down Web Street, which is the web branch of this. And then where does it pop up again? Well, look there. This is standing now on Price's Fork Road, and you can see the uh, engineering buildings here in the geology building. And you can see that it's daylighted for a little bit there before they drop it under the parking lots there and get it from that corner all the way down to the duck pond. Okay, so then it shows up again. And it, over here is that willow tree that we were looking at and it's coming across that whole series of parking lots and is coming into the upper dock, duck pond right there. And then of course, the duck ponds drain out as one stream and then becomes Struble's Creek. And this is what runs along and goes down beside Smithfield Plantation. There are actually several other uh, springs as well. We won't go into those. We really were kind of focusing around uh, the original layout of the town of Blacksburg with these three streams. But for instance, at the, uh, the football stadium, there's a natural spring there under the football stadium. Where does that show up? Next to the vet school, the little pond is there. That's spring fed. Uh, and then that all joins in and, and joins Struble's Creek as well, you know, just beyond Smithfield. So this is a, a stencil that you, I hope, have seen and paid attention to because one of the problems that we have here is that the spring water that we are running through these small channels is also collecting our storm water off of the roads. And so everywhere that we've been talking about the streams uh, being daylighted and then going under a road, there's a, on the road side of that, there's a little drain like this that drops into that. And SEEDS, Mike's uh, nonprofit organization, is one of the ones that is mainly responsible for making us aware of the fact that these are draining to a stream and it's important for us to try to keep things off of the roadways and off of our lawns, for instance, so that we're not sending stuff into uh, the streams that way. So this is kind of the passageway now to turn this over to Mike. Uh, I won't spend too much time, but just to introduce you a little bit to uh, Seeds and what we do. Uh, we started in 1995 as a community organization to inspire kids' love for learning and to help take better care of our community and, and learn some more things about our community while they're growing up here. Uh, in 2006, Seeds in the town of Blacksburg and also my department at Virginia Tech Biological Sciences got in the conversation about uh, moving over to the Price House and reinvigorating and, and breathing some new life into the town's nature center. So we're over there now in this, well, right on the edge of the 16 blocks in the Price House, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that as we go along here. So we're operating the Price, the Seeds Blacksburg Nature Center at the Price House. You should all come over and visit. It's a beautiful historic home built in 1840, a log house, and I'll show you some pictures of it here. Uh, as Terry showed you, we're right there in the 16 blocks between Lee Street and Roanoke Street on Wharton Street. And here's the Price House on Wharton Street. So it was actually one of the first houses built uh, after the town was formed, and, and the house was built in 1840. And I, I like what Terry said about the town kind of taking a long time to uh, to take off and the lots to sell, and part of that was because the railroad decided to take a different route to the west. Um, the, I guess the Irontown, Ohio Railroad took a shot at it and got some water out of the Roanoke River, but maybe they weren't able to get enough water out of Struble's Creek or something, I don't know. So we got the Huckleberry out of it. So at the Nature Center, we're focusing in on our seasonal uh, beauty here in the area and our environment and part of our mission is to work on, the, on studying and enlightening the community uh, about our freshwater heritage here. So back in 1995, I got real interested. I, I, my background's in, in aquatics and, and aquatic ecology, and I was very interested in doing something that I could do long term as long as I lived here. And what better thing than try to take care of the, the streams here. Uh, I was aware as a, a student here when I was in graduate school that, like many other communities around the country, we buried our streams in pipes and put them under roads and we're feeding our road runoff into the roads and was aware of some of the work going on, like Lynn Sharp who's here tonight with the Save Our Streams program. And I got to meet David and Lindsay West and 
uh, how they were stewarding the stream behind their property. And I was hoping that we could get more folks to do that around town. So, and in fact, that last slide uh, right over here is the spring house behind the West's property. And they can tell you all about that. I won't get into it here, but beautiful, uh, preserved, and water still comes out and flows through it and goes right out into the stream there. Uh, one of our focuses over at the Nature Center is to work on watershed education. And I've been pushing this freshwater heritage idea for a long time, and I'm so glad that Terry's real interested in it. And when I had my stint on the Blacksburg Museum Committee, it seemed like the folks who were on the committee were real interested in it. So that sort of made my life a whole lot easier, because I realized that folks in town were really interested in learning more about and preserving our freshwater heritage here. So we're doing some things over at the Price House to uh, awaken the freshwater heritage education program. We have a, a small watershed exhibit that we're planning on growing into a actual little 3D of Blacksburg where it will rain down and the kids can see where the water flows out into the different streams from here. So we'll, we're working on that right now. Um, the whole idea of the freshwater heritage goes back a long time, I think. I think folks here have been real interested in uh, the fact that the town is here because of the water for quite a long time. Um, I just thought it was a cool name, really. Freshwater Heritage sounds like something people might get interested in, and I'm so glad that the town's gotten interested in through Terry in adopting this as a town-wide uh, project. So we learned a little bit about the Continental Divide, and I wanted to share with you one other picture. Uh, this is the area that drains the Missouri-Mississippi. So it's just over half the contiguous U.S. is draining down into the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, including where we are right now. Um, if you can imagine when there were dinosaurs on this planet, there was also a shallow inland sea. And the petrified forest in Arizona was a big river that flowed into it, and those petrified logs are what's left of that river. And here, if you go out around here and you look at the fossils that we have in the rocks, what do you find? Seashells. And that shows us that we were living where there used to be a seabed. Well, I liken it to a bathtub that's drained out. As the continents shifted and time has gone on, that inland sea just drained and drained and drained like a big old bathtub. And what do we have left? The Mississippi River. Seems mighty to us, but compared to a big giant sea, that's all that's left is the, in quote, trickle down out into the Gulf of Mexico. But we're carrying a lot of water from this country out into the Mississippi. And so every town, every small community, every large town and city has to play a role in protecting this fresh water both the heritage and the quality of the water so that the water quality remains potable and, u and usable for everybody. So just in this area, this is Montgomery County, uh, there's a lot of streams and as Terry said, there was a lot of opportunities for settlement in the valleys for farming and, and just personal and, and family use of the water. But have you thought about where your water comes from and where it goes? And that's what I want to do with you here tonight a little bit is, kind of, is give you a tour all the way to the Mississippi River, or all actually to the Gulf of Mexico. That's where we're going to go tonight. So if we take off from Blacksburg and you can see the drill field and all the branches of Struble's Creek, the branch coming from Spout Spring and the branch coming through the central part of town and Webb Branch coming across here all into the duck pond that's right here and all draining out into the main Stu uh, Main Struble's Creek, that's what we're going to follow. So here's Brush Mountain, and the Continental Divide is behind us from the airplane here. And if you go a little bit upstream, you see Claytor Lake, and Claytor Lake, of course, is a reservoir held back by this hydroelectric dam, so where a lot of us are, are using this river for all kinds of, of uh, uses, not just uh, drinking water, but people have built all kinds of homes on Claytor Lake and use it for recreation, and, and there's the hydroelectric dam as well. When we get down a little downstream closer to McCoy, folks have gotten more interested in protecting the water quality, and you'll see signs like this now, and you'll see signs along the road about what stream you're crossing and what watershed it is in, and I think that's all good to help folks learn and, and become more aware. As we flow downstream, 
past Blacksburg and through Giles County, and remember folks in Giles County are taking the water out and putting their wastewater back in just like we are. Uh, we're taking water that's already been used by Radford and folks upstream and all the way up into the Blue Ridge. And here we get into the gorge in West Virginia and it becomes sort of the wild and wonderful New River in West Virginia. And in Charleston, here's where the New River joins with the Kanawha, and right there is Charleston, West Virginia. And from there on, it's called the Kanawha River. So the New River, technically name-wise, ends there in Charleston, although, of course, the river continues on as the Kanawha River. <coughs> in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, the Kanawha joins the Ohio. And you can just ima imagine Mary Ingalls trying to make her way all the way home and making the right turns, because she was there, all the way down there in the Ohio River Valley, and had to make her way up the Kanawha and to make that right turn and go up the new instead of making the left turn and going up the Kanawha, so she, she made it home. And continuing on, the Ohio flowing through Cincinnati. Uh, so a lot of folks using the water, taking it out and putting it back. The good news is if you, put, if you take the water out and you put it through sewage treatment, it's got to go in in better quality than you took it out. If it didn't, well, none of us would be able to use the water. So the actual water is going back into the river uh, in better shape than when it was taken out for us to drink and use in our kitchens and our bathrooms. Continuing on through Louisville, Kentucky, and finally to Cairo, Illinois. We all have to say things differently here, right? We can't call it Cairo. It's got to be Cairo, Illinois. The Ohio joins the mighty old M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S -S and from there, all the way down to New or Orleans. And, and folks in New Orleans will tell you, by the time they get their drinking water, they can't count how many folks it's been in and out of by the time they get it. So. <laughs> and that's the truth. So we've already seen this slide. So we know about the 16 blocks. I'm just going to bring us home again into Blacksburg and talk a little bit more about our ecology here and, and how we use the water. So first, we needed the springs to settle here. The animals needed the springs and to settle here and, and migrate through. And then the town started to grow. William Black said for a small town, and the town started to grow after he left. And it grew and grew, and the school grew, and more folks came. And right around 1900, people became really worried. And you think we have problems now. Imagine not knowing where your water was going to come from in about 20 to 30 years. And that was one of the big problems here in Blacksburg. Not only that, some of the springs were suspect of producing typhoid, and they had to close. So people started digging more wells. So we had a real water problem here in Blacksburg around the turn of the 20th century. And little old Main Street uh, was getting worried about whether it could go any further. So. Folks started to say, how about a water authority? Well, you know what that means? <laughs> Money. Who's going to pay for it? And you know what happens when the tax word is brought up? Everyone gets in a, everyone's feathers get ruffled up, right? So it was a big deal. And it took a long time. But by the 1930s, 40s, it was determined we're going to have a water authority. And in the 1950s, it got off the ground. Uh, and in the mid-1950s, Blacksburg, and Christiansburg, and BPI agreed to vo form the Water Authority. And it would be paid for through uh, fees and using the water and the sewage treatment. Notice that Montgomery County opted out to join the Water Authority. And now sections of Montgomery County are trying to opt in to the Water Authority. So um, things have changed over that period of time as well. But it wasn't until about 1960 that the first trickles of water came here and started to feed the pipes and feed the folks in the town. And one thing I, I wanted to mention about the 16 blocks, it was two blocks to go get your water. Who do you think was going to get that water? You, right there. You were the ones sent off to go get the water with the yoke and the buckets. And so whenever I bring kids out there, I always say, guess who invented plumbing? <laughs> it was the kids who invented invented the plumbing. And right on the Price House grounds, if you come look right adjacent to the, to the Iris Gardens, you'll see an old pump, uh, a gravity-fed pump. That whole area is plumbed with, uh, with pipes that come from the spring. And you can see that big pipe when, uh, from the picture that Terry showed that fanned out into smaller pipes that began to feed uh, the folks who lived in that 16 blocks and around the campus over time. 
So around 1960, uh, which is really recent history, we started having a public water supply. And you should talk to David and Lindsay West after this talk because they didn't opt into the water supply right away either. It took, they were using their spring for several years until they sort of had to opt into the public water after their pump froze up. Is that what you but you like that spring water. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. So there's folks in the room who used the spring water until just fairly recently. So here we are, blacks were growing through the 70s and into our uh, modern times. Let's take a look at Struble's Creek. In 1998, the Department of Environmental Quality determined that Struble's Creek was, in quote, impaired. And when that happens, when the Department of Environmental Quality determines that there's an impairment in the stream, the local community has to come up with a plan to restore the stream. And it's supposed to be done in about 15 years, otherwise there's no fine. Nobody says anything. There's no fine. So probably it's going to take a lot longer than that for it to happen, because there's no fine involved. What's the problem? The main problem that we have here uh, is right here. We have fine sediment that runs off from our streets. Uh, anytime you see folks parking their cars off the street on the grass and it gets kind of muddy, all that goes into the stream. And it comes up every time there's a storm, there's just waves of fine sediment that move down Struble's Creek. And then the rain stops, a few days pass, and it looks crystal clear again. There's nothing wrong with the stream, but if you put your hand down there on the rocks and wave it around a little bit, all that sediment comes up. And every time it rains, all that sediment comes up and it keeps making its way down towards the New River. Well, not everything breathes from the air. If you've got gills and you're living underwater, you've got to breathe through that sediment, and that causes some trouble. There's also evidence that there's a problem with coliform bacteria in Struble's Creek as well. <coughs> So one of the things that we can do is improve the habitat for the living things that live on the bottom of the stream. That's called the benthic habitat. And when Terry was talking about planting trees along the stream side, that's called the riparian habitat, the area of the stream that's on the stream banks. And planting a buffer of trees helps to shade, keep the stream cool, and help to provide more habitat for all the other living things that need that water in order to keep that water clean for us as well. So I think part of the, the, the meeting the goal here is also to continually to do as much work educating folks as, as we can uh, through Save Our Streams, through taking kids out to the stream, through the stormwater stencils, through having talks like this. Uh, the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at Virginia Tech is doing a wonderful job doing some riparian buffer work along Struble's Creek. So there are folks out there more and more interested in this, which I think is a great thing. And it provides for lifelong learning, I think. I've been at this now for 17 years, and hopefully I've got a few more years left in me, and I'm going to keep pushing this because I think it's really important. And I think the day that you stop is the day people start to forget about it once again. So there's always opportunities. Uh, some of these, these are Blacksburg High School kids and a couple of Virginia Tech students that are now in their almost 40 years old, so this is a long time ago. Uh, right behind where Turner Street joins Giles Road, there's a fourplex apartment building, and in their backyard is an old spring house. And right about there is where that web branch of Struble's Creek begins to run all the time, and then it runs onward. As Lindsay West pointed out, it's daylighted all the way down to behind Heavener Hardware just for a little bit. It just really goes under Main Street through a pipe there. So for most of that branch of Struble's Creek, it is daylighted. And, and behind the West's house, where it's preserved, is actually the, the best quality that we see in Struble's Creek and in Blacksburg at all. The other thing that we need is, is time for things to heal. Uh, in the late 1990s, Virginia Tech decided they wanted to pave the parking lot that's between Price's Fork Road and where Whittemore and Daring and Cogill Hall are and where that big parking deck is now and where the new engineering building is going up right there now. 
And before they did that, they wanted to ensure that that parking lot, the pipes that carried the stream under it, weren't going to get all clogged up with sediment because they knew that there was a sediment problem. Every time we had a storm, there's loads and loads of sediment that flow down the stream. And all it takes is a bunch of leaves and sediment to combine with some logs. They get under there and boom, it's clogged up and it's a big flooding problem. So what did they do? On Web Branch, they dug it all out and put in these gabions, these basically chicken wire filled with rocks. And people look at them and they say, what an awful eyesore. They do look kind of awful. But actually, they're a heck of a lot better than putting a concrete run. And I'll show you why. Here is the same spot about three years ago. All it takes is some time for those rocks to start having sediment fill up in between them, for plants to start to grow, uh, for the stream to actually start to look like it's taken a little course in, in that open area in here. It, it wa meanders just a little bit as rocks have tumbled in and taken up position. We've seen all kinds of wildlife. Some you'd like to see, and some of you who don't like water snakes probably wouldn't like to see those there, but they're in there too, and they're completely harmless. So this is uh, some Virginia Tech students and some Blacksburg High School students doing some stream cleanup work with us there. So between that period of time, which is about 15 years, there's been a huge improvement uh, in the environmental quality as the stream makes its way towards the Virginia Tech campus. And a little while ago, I don't think I have a picture of this here, but Terry showed you that picture uh, of the little willow-lined open spot at the beginning of the campus. That's actually technically a spot to fill up with mud so that it doesn't all get going underneath the parking lot area. And every several years, they have to come in with backhoes and dig all that mud out so that it can fill up with mud again. That's called a <laughs> stormwater detention pond right there. So, and it's doing its job. So here at the Spout Spring that Terry was talking about, uh, the college and the Spout Spring, sometimes I hear it called the College Spring, but I think that's technically now we're, we're assuming that's the one that's over there by the stadium. Uh, and the Spout Spring. So we see that the university, well, the, then the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College was trying to purchase springs in the late 1800. They knew that if the population of the town and the school was going to grow, they had to get some, their hands on some water, which they did. Uh, the town bought the Spout Spring in 1963. And what we're trying to do is to continue building this self-guided walking tour. So that folks can go out, let's say you come over to the Nature Center over at the Price House, uh, you talk to us there, you can pick up some information and then go out and do a little walking tour yourself. Or go out on one of Terry's 16 blocks tours. Once in a while I'll do one that focuses on the spring too and, and learn about our freshwater heritage. So there's definitely potential to improve the water quality and the habitat. I think, again, one of the most important things you can do is just to continue taking people out and teaching them about it, uh, establishing a system of these freshwater heritage sites so that you can string them together within a walkable distance. Folks can go, you can, if you want to take enough time, you can, you, it's a short drive, but you could technically walk within an hour, let's say, from Turner Street and Giles Road down to uh, uh, Owen Street and over to Wharton Street to Clay Street, see all these sites, and then walk over onto campus and go down to the duck pond and have yourself a picnic. So there's a lot you can do in that period of time. The Community Design Assistance Center worked with us a few years ago to develop a plan to take the Spout Spring site. So Terry showed you some, excuse me, Terry showed you some pictures of the, the Spout Spring site with the pipe coming out and the water still flowing. And then right here on Clay Street, there's a little section where you can park some cars. This is sort of our Nature Center overflow parking lot. And the town owns this property right here. So um, with a little bit more funding, we could probably uh, do some more planting and daylighting and make it a sort of an enjoyable park site as well. And then folks have come in and uh, what's Michael's last name? can't remember his last name. The gentleman who painted this mural just slipped my mind. So right there on, on Draper Road. You remember the old name for Draper Road? Water Street. 
That's right. You're well, you guys are right on the ball. Water Street. So right here on Old Water Street or Draper Road is that great mural. And this is where I'll usually end our tour with families and kids so that they can enjoy uh, Struble's Greek artwork as well. So come on over and visit us. Mm -hmm. We've got some amphibians over there. We've got some amphibian masks you can wear too. Thank you.